Is the DA planning to go into coalition with the ANC? It's beginning to look that way. It's beginning to look as if the DA is soft launching this idea going into the election and they're trying to manage the expectations of some of their voters around what they're going to do after the election. Now, there's a clip that has been circulating, but there's also an older clip that seems to support both of these ideas. Let's watch. I, I, I got sent this morning by a flurry of people, funny enough, trying to share intelligence, that Helen Ziller has said categorically that they will form a government with the ANC. I think these consolidate give me a an oratory lesson to do It's a life strong lesson. I must try to look after this. I think I do understand that we take to understand the whole state of all how much black, wrong, if you did it for a while, I think I'm going to get here on that. That's what I'm saying. How of my power is doing in the context of Polish area? 20% is big. It's what? A one seat part of two seat part. Mm-hmm. It's a big block. And then the AFC falls to, say, 40%. I grow up, make tough amounts, and so for one of those who's paying the soup. I was to find that I'm here and going to find you should be there and make sure I'm missions for them and going to urge you. Yeah, yeah. And then I should be out a furious stage. But this all You must try and get the same part here. You want to point to the center to that. And the member is a way for saying one. But then you have to put in point us. That puts us to the world while we validated your validation. So this clip, the second clip, is from 2019, and it seems as if the DA is very happy to be anywhere between 15 and 20 so that they can negotiate with the Ramaphosa administration to be in coalition to hold them to account. So let's explore some of the implications of this pre-election. The DA is campaigning on being anti-corruption, anti-crime, and anti-cater deployment. They say the ANC is the perpetrator of these bad things, you know, corruption, crime, and cater deployment. They blame the ANC for the failures of South Africa to grow, the failures of South Africa to exploit its opportunities, and they blame the ANC and its policies of cater deployment for a lot of the problems we see. They also want to scrap Black economic empowerment. They want to scrap employment equity. They oppose the NHI, all of which are policies of the African National Congress. So when they campaign on this platform to their, you know, their audiences and say, listen, this is what we're doing, those audiences assume that they're going to go into the platform of parliament to oppose this to the National Assembly. But if they then form a coalition with the ANC, the ANC will have to give some concessions to the DA but the DA will have to give some concessions to the ANC. And we'll do an analysis of that. But it seems to me that there's something sketchy of to going to the electorate saying, vote for me so that I can fight the ANC. And then after the event, to then go in and say, I'm now going into a relationship with the ANC as the least of the worst options, which is the argument they make. The argument that they make as well, the Democratic Alliance, is that the MK and the EFF and the ANC would be the worst alliance possible. They say this because they say Julius Malema will pursue totalitarian perspectives. Jacob Zuma wants to unravel the constitution and that if you have the ANC, MK and EFF together in a coalition, that will lead to chaos in South Africa. The premise of their argument is that none of these is that all of these people are going to implement everything they say, no deviation. I think that this argument is a bit of a stretch because Julius Malema, Jacob Zuma, and other members of the ANC have already been in the same platform together and they didn't burn down South Africa. 
And we've already had a Jacob Zuma administration. He was somebody who actually respected the constitution and allowed um, for opposition parties to operate, to go to his house in Gandla, for the media to criticize him, for there to be all kinds of reports about him, which cannot be said about all of the presidents. Uh, some of them have been less willing to be scrutinized, more recent presidents. So Jacob Zuma was implicated in a lot of things like Gandla, but the whole democratic fabric did not fall apart. And even if MK and EFF were to form a coalition, it's unlikely that they will have a two-thirds majority to be able to unravel the, the constitution. So all I'm saying is that it seems an exaggerated argument to say the EFF and ANC will destroy everything, but we, the DA and the ANC, will not do that. It seems to me that there's a premise in the argument that Julius Malema cannot compromise or that he's not a reasonable person or he's not a constitutionalist while the Democratic Alliance are the ones who are the constitutionalist. I think all of the political parties adhere to the constitution. Whether you like them or love them, you got to think everyone went to the electoral court. Everyone followed the process. Everyone made their arguments um, within the framework of the institutions in this election. Nobody took it to the streets. Nobody made it violent. It seems as if everyone was willing to play ball within the constitutional framework and make their arguments within the constitutional framework. But let's go back to the Democratic Alliance. This this is not a trivial story. We've had two different publications this week, this weekend, talking about it, just three days before the election. You had... Um, one article in the Sunday Times, sorry, in the Citizen, and another article, City Press. One article in the City Press and another article in the Sunday World, all of which talking about this particular issue. So it's not a trivial uh, issue. It's not a speculative issue at this particular point. It's something that is on the table. Here's what I think will happen if the DA and the ANC form a coalition. And, and this is going to be the con continuity coalition. This is going to be where most of the things remain the same, right? Now, the DA will not be able to necessarily be able to force the ANC to scrap BE, employment equity, or even remove the NHI. Those things are not likely to happen. And they will lose votes, right? In, in, in terms of if it's taken to a vote, they'll lose those votes. And also, once they get into that coalition, they won't be able to get out easily because they've already said that they view the other coalition to be much worse. So their exit strategy is limited. Once they commit, they commit, and they'll have to be in it till the end. So that, that's what I think. What, what's likely to happen, and I've seen this before, and, and uh, let me give you some examples before I go on to what's likely to happen. The DA and the ANC had a difference of opinion when it came to the appointment of advocate Kolega Talega as the, the public protector. ANC voted anyway. They had a difference of opinion when it came to the Section 89 panel report. ANC voted anyway. They are not likely to stop the ANC doing what it wants. They're not going to stop Begitele and all of these guys who they say are problems within the policing system. What is likely to happen is the following. They are going to find consensus with the ANC on areas of agreement. Where does the ANC under Ramaphosa agree with the DA? The privatization and breaking up of ESCOM, the privatization and breaking up of uh, Transnet, the privatization of water. In, in fact, if you look at the DA manifesto, it speaks about the privatization of water. And I'm going to talk about the implications of the privatization of public goods a little bit later. So what's likely to happen is that when the DA tries to hold the ANC to account, they'll fail. They won't be able to live um, the coalition because they view that coalition as being worse. But then also, um, all they'll be able to do is to vote symbolically, but they still won't have enough votes to make any difference when it comes to any of the issues around corruption, cater deployment, around who the cabinet is. And maybe John Stenhazen gets a vice presidency position and he deals with business, government business, um, and that becomes the limit of that. We've seen with Didi Mabuza that that can sometimes not be the most effective role to occupy in government. All it does is it sanitizes some of the decisions that have been made by the ANC government with the business community. It's a PR uh, position that with the business community in some instances. Anyway, we'll talk about that a little bit a little bit later, right? So this continuity coalition means that a lot of the problems 
that people care about in places like Kailicha, like Langa, are not necessarily going to change because the DA believes that they're doing a good job. That's what they think. They think that they're doing a good job in all of those areas in as much as the ANC believes it's doing a good job in the Eastern Cape. So when it comes to service delivery for marginalized communities, nothing much is going to change. What is going to change is the continued privatization. This is the continuity coalition. It provides the least amount of disruption, and this is why markets like it, and some people even within the international community like it, because it's the no drama coalition in the sense that everything will basically stay the same from the 28th of May until the 1st of June, and even 1st of July, whatever. There's not going to be a change. Some of the you know, radical, quote-unquote, thinkers and, and uh, parties are not going to have any access to even think about reforming certain things. So markets love continuity. They don't like disruption. They just like to be able to make money and make no mistake, big companies are making money in South Africa, even though the economy is showing pains, such as low growth and high unemployment and high inequality. So let's discuss the multi-charter partners, multi-party charter partners. These guys basically were tricked. And they were lulled into a false sense of security. Because if already the DA had a plan that even if they get between 15 and 20, they can make a deal with the ANC. And it seems as if already there's a soft launch of this idea, uh, expectation management for the public of this particular coalition. It's already being pitched, right? All that means that everybody who jumped on board with that multi-party charter, assuming that they were going to be able to, you know, form some kind of a power block, were tricked, right? So that's Action SA and other parties. So what they did is because they thought that they're in this thing and they're meeting every other Thursday, that yeah, no, we're moving. And then it may have killed their energy strategy and aggressiveness towards the Democratic Alliance. Because, for instance, if you're the Action SA, now you're in the multi-party charter coalition. They say rescue SA, you have to say fix SA. You can't really go with them very hard. You can't go and compete against them in the same spaces and places in the same um, amount of zeal that you would have if you were direct rivals. So what the, what it does, it kills your momentum and energy. And it also makes voters wonder, why would I vote for you when I could just vote for the DA? Because you guys are just going to go into a coalition with the DA. This is why a lot of the multi-party charter coalition partners are not doing well in the election. Now, let's talk about the prospects for the DA long term. The prospects for the DA long term is that this particular decision will lead to loss of support for them after the election, right? Because what's going to happen is you came to voters saying, we are opposed to the ANC. We think the ANC is the reason for all of the problems in South Africa. With the ANC is pushing uh, corruption, crime, cater deployment. It's leading to all kinds of things. And they are a race-based party. All of that stuff that you've been saying. And then you go in into a partnership with them. Even if you say it's the least of, the, of, of all evils, still, I'm not going to trust you the next time around. And voters will not likely come back to the DA in 2020. Um, six and in 2029 with the same level of enthusiasm and trust but for the da that may be worth it you know a slow decline it sometimes is better than a crash landing and they may be happy to take it especially if they can still govern areas like the western cape etc so they, there's a, an interesting case study for this before i move on the case study is what happened with um the democratic unionist party in the uk they made a coalition with Theresa May of the Conservative Party. And in their next election, they actually lost seats. They had 10 seats. And then in the next election, they lost th seven, uh, sorry, three seats. They moved from 10 to seven. And they're not looking as if they're going to do well in this current upcoming election, which is going to be held on the 4th of July. So that's an example of what can happen sometimes if you enter into a coalition which is against your values and principles um, as a le lesser of evils type of coalition arrangement. Right, So they're likely to um, lose support as a result of this, especially going into the upcoming elections. But they may not care because five years is a long time. They, you play the game, you get five years, maybe the donors will give you some more money, you play the game again, maybe you drop to 12, maybe now the other side is on 39, you're on 12, you can still do it again, 10 more years of, of, of this continuity um, coalition. 
right? What does it mean for the markets, prospects for the markets? The markets are very, very nervous about seeing a Julius Malema, MK, ANC coalition. They're very worried that Julius Malema is a radical. They don't want to see Julius Malema anywhere close to power. And they keep demonizing this left, left, left leaning coalition. They don't want anything left, right? Even though some of the ideas of the left are not bad, right? A lot of the social justice policies seek to create redress opportunities for marginalized and disenfranchised people who got that way as a result of colonization, apartheid, and racist and neoliberal policies of the global order that continue to marginalize and ostracize black people in particular. So the markets don't like any of that. Once you start to sound like what I just said, ooh, ooh, ooh. once you sound social justice, they don't want to hear that. They want to hear SWOT analysis. They want to hear uh, you talking about margins. They want to hear you talk about supply chain. They want to hear you talking about profit maximization. They want to hear you talking about all of the things which affect the bottom line. They don't want to hear this social justice stuff and they will demonize many people who even try to make ar arguments around the need for equity, the need for redress, even in countries like South Africa. And then they'll tell you, don't be a victim, don't complain, blah, 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 blah. Even though <laughs> Western countries have sought reparations for countries that they view to have violated them in different wars and different periods of history, even though Western countries have paid reparations to each other, they, they often say to um, African people, forget about it, move on, don't be victims. Story for another day, though. So the prospects for the market in a, in a continuity coalition, they're going to like it. The RAND is going to do well. Profit maximization is going to do well. And because of... Um, the benefits to the private equity sector from all of these privatizations, which will continue, you will see a very positive story in news, in business newspapers, that kind of thing. A lot of money is going to be made and um, the markets are going to be happy with this. There's big deals that are being made uh, by Vumatel and Vodacom and um, Duck, Duck, what is it called? Duck Fiber Internet, DFA. Dark Fiber, whatever it's called, that company, Duck and Vodacom, they're all planning around how to take more control of um, network infrastructure, public goods. So just imagine you have private water, private electricity, private internet, nothing will be provided by the state and all of these private equity firms will be making a lot of money. But this is where it comes to prospects for consumers and voters. What happens when public goods are owned by private actors? More and more, what happens is that at the beginning, there's sometimes you know, an improvement in the quality of service you get. But over time, as we've seen in the United Kingdom with uh, the privatization of their water, is that there's sewage in the Thames River right now. And they are actually trying to now find ways to get the water clean and to finance the water sector. So, And they're considering nationalization of, uh, you know, uh, UK water to kind of like resuscitate what's happening because the quality has gone bad. So what's likely to happen is that the costs go up and the quality goes down. Go and look at what's happening with Thames water, the sewage in the river, in the Thames River, one of the most famous rivers. They're drinking sewage water in the UK because they privatized the water sector in the 90s. So it doesn't reduce the cost of living either because um, these private companies come for pr profit maximization. So what's going to happen is that water right now is relatively affordable and you get a certain amount for free um, in terms of everyone has got a daily um, free amount that they get. But you're going to start seeing that daily amount going down, the one you get for free and the cost of water going up in the same way that electricity went up. Do you remember Do you remember what Patrice Mutsepa said about the cost of electricity? He said it was too cheap. I want to play you that clip as, as a concluding clip. But that's likely to happen. And those voters who live in marginalized communities Kailicha, Langa, Cape Flats, who are hoping that this election will change their lives. If there's a DA ANC coalition, it's going to be a continuity coalition, meaning everything is relatively going to remain the same. Are you going to see an improvement in Langa, in Kailicha, in Kukuletu? Unlikely. Unlikely because what's the incentive for the DA to change? There's no incentive. There's no accountability for them. They'll be able to continue to manage the Western Cape in the way that they have, which benefits those with, with affluence and influence, but does not benefit those who are ostracized, marginalized, and live on the peripheries of the wealth uh, and access in the Western Cape. So, yeah, I'm, I, I'm wondering, what do you think? What do you think about, about this whole situation? 
And also, have you heard what Patrice Mutsipe said long ago? Fast forward to now, he now owns a lot of the IPP providers and his company, which is, um, you know, a World Economic Forum supported company, is all over the place, sponsoring stuff at university, owns the soccer team that wins seven se series, every seven league uh, titles uh, e consecutively. But you got to think about the cost of electricity. It's gone up. Do you pay for units? Have you seen how expensive your units and tariffs are? But this is what the man said in 2008, 2009. This is what he said. Over the years, there's been some discussions about introducing competitors to, to ESCOM. And uh, it, in many parts of the world, you do have these independent power producers. Uh, I don't know at this stage as to what, uh, how competitive. And in fact, uh, the information I received in the past was that because ESCOM was so cheap, uh, it was unattractive for independent power producers to enter into the market. But uh, we have to look at uh, at the cost of electricity and and uh, mitigate those those expenses as best we can, and we will do that. So, do you see what I'm talking about? Do you see what I'm talking about when you compare the price of electricity now? What a thousand rand gets you, what 500 rand gets you, the price has gone up. As the privatization of ESCOM has occurred, the price of electricity has, has started going up. This is what's likely to happen with the cost of um, rail and everything related to Transnet. This is what's likely to go on with water. And the DA is going to approve these policies and actually celebrate them because they believe in more privatization, not less, even of public goods. It's in their manifesto. But is that in the interest of voters? What do you think? What do you think about a DAANC coalition? After having listened to all of this, is it something that you think is the lesser of all evils? Is it something that affects your deliberations and considerations going into Wednesday? Let's have a conversation, but don't forget to like, subscribe, Lots of you are still not subscribed. Let's subscribe. Let's grow the channel. Let's spread the word. Till the next.